Good morning. Good morning. Um, we do have an ask the pastor question that I want to address before we get into the word. Um, Uh, the question is, does God hear the prayers of unbelievers? That's a good question. It's also kind of a difficult one to answer. First reason being, why would an unbeliever be praying to a God they don't believe exists? So, I'm going to kind of address this more from the point of someone that is... Um, has an exposure to God and, and might accept the reality that God is there, but is in no wise serving Him. Um, and the answer is yes. No. <laughs> yes. The long and the short of it is this. Um, actually, in, uh, I think it's John. I wrote it down. Yeah, uh, John chapter 9, verse 31. I'm going to flip over there real quick and just read this to you so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, this is after the healing of the blind man. And the religious leaders are investigating what's going on. And they talk to the man. They talk to his parents. Uh, the parents don't want it to get in trouble, so they say, hey, he's of age, talk to him. And so they come back and they talk to him, and then um, I'm going to pick up um, 24, verse 24. Uh, so for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus, they, they're saying Jesus is a, sin, is a sinner. And he answered, he being the blind man who formerly was blind, the man formerly known as blind man. Okay? Uh, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That folks right there is our testimony. Okay? I know a lot of times we go, oh, I, I don't, this, this guy's got a lot of questions I won't be able to answer. And they want to ask you things involving theology and philosophy and a lot of other philosophies that really have no bearing whatsoever on your relationship with God. Okay? This man had no clue who Jesus was. All he knew was that he was blind and now he sees. And that's the core of each one of our testimonies. Okay? So... Um, Verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. He's kind of got an attitude, doesn't he? <laughs> um, why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Ouch. <clears throat> and they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin and would teach us, and they cast him out. Oh, you're just a sinner. We don't have to listen to you. Now, uh, verse 31, the man is speaking. He says, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Okay, that would kind of lead us to the opinion that if an unbeliever or, or a person that is pre-cross were to pray, God would ignore it. I don't believe that's what is being said here. Because if that were the case, 
none of us would ever get to be saved because as sinners we call out to God to save us and he would ignore us. Okay? So the first rule of hermeneutics, Bible study, is that all scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture. So you never take just one passage, you always hold it up in light of all the other passages. First, those passages that give it context, the relevancy, what it was saying, what the author, the writer, the speaker was saying in context, and then you compare it to the rest of God's word, okay? And I don't believe what this man is saying here is an all-encompassing statement that God never hears sinners. And I know that because we have a number of cases where sinners called out to God and he heard them. Uh, for example, in Jonah, the entire city of Nineveh that were in such a sinful state that God had determined to wipe them off the face of the earth. Jonah, after a little detour, a little segue, gets around to telling them that the wrath of God is going to come on them and they repent and they call out to God and they say, forgive us. And the, and the, the, the king even says, you know, we're all going to fast and pray that we wouldn't be destroyed. And God relents in his anger. <clears throat> we see time and again the Syrophoenician woman in the New Testament who came to Jesus and asked to heal um, her daughter, asked him to heal her daughter. And in, in no way does it indicate that she was a believer. She believed in what he could do, but there's nothing that indicates she was a good Jew. And yet Jesus addresses her and he says, it's not right to give the dogs food meant for the children. And she said, well, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And then he moves according to her faith, and her daughter is healed. Okay? So there are a number of cases um, where a <coughs> sinner, an unbeliever, or, or you know, I, I'm not really sure how to address this specifically, because, like I said, an unbeliever is not going to pray to a God they don't believe in. In a moment of panic, though, I think you come to realize how desperately you need a God to be there to answer what you cannot. <clears throat> Crises always instigates faith. All right? Um, so the, the, the short answer is, does God hear an unbeliever's prayer? Yes. Will God respond to an unbeliever's prayer according to his will? Yes. But there is a special favor. There is a unique relationship between a believer and God that is not there between an unbeliever and God. Now, always God hears the cry for salvation. Always. Okay? But God knows everything. So when we say, does God hear? Well, yeah, he already knows. So it's not a necessity for him to hear. But whether or not he will respond, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's completely dependent on that person's heart. Okay? So I can't say blanket-wise yes, neither can I say blanket-wise no. So the answer is yes, no, yes. Okay? So, um, thank you for that question. Um, I will leave this up here on the front. I, I put some more scripture references in the explanation. Um, We have a huge, huge praise today. Um, Pastor Abedini has been released. Three years, uh, we actually prayed November, right? It was November, marked three years that he had been, actually I think it was October, was three years he had been imprisoned in Iran. No hope of him getting out. Uh, he has been freed, he is coming home. That is a huge praise God. God uses the internal machinations of diplomacy to accomplish his wills. And Pastor Abedini is coming home. Um, we have a huge prayer request. Um, I, I want to share this now because I want to deal with this right up front and I want us to pray together. Um, Donovan's family, in-laws, the G-Box, uh, his brother-in-law and uh, his brother-in-law Brad and, and Brad's wife uh, they were expecting a baby. She was 24 weeks pregnant. Yesterday, they had to do an emergency C-section. And this morning, their baby passed away. And so we're going to take a moment right now, and we're going to lift up Brad and Liz 
and just ask that God would sustain them and he would touch them at this time. So, Father, we come to you right now. And I lift Brad and Liz to you, Father. And I just ask, God, that you would in some way ease their pain. Father, that you would comfort them, that you would touch them. Father, I am asking that even as the shepherd gathers the lamb and holds it close to his heart, Father, you would take Brad and Liz and you would hold them close to your heart. God, that they would feel your arms and know your love. And I ask, Lord God, that in some way, in some way, Father, you would receive glory in this. And we ask a blessing over the entire GBOC family. Father, as the questions of why are bound to come, I am asking God that you would provide answers, that you would give them peace. And Father, let this be a moment that would drive them to you and not away. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for the freedom of Pastor Abedini for answering prayers, God, that have been lifted up over years. And we ask, Father, that you would bring him home quickly to be with his wife and his children. We honor you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have your Bibles, there's one in the seat in front of you. Ministering the word is, is an interesting challenge because I can do study and I can make notes and I can prepare messages and ultimately everything is dependent on what God would have me do. And I have uh, two series that I want to address this year um, and, and I'm hoping, God willing, that we'll get to those later. Um, but I feel like God wants me to start off this year getting back to basics. And last week we talked about what faith is and what it isn't, what it ain't. And <clears throat> this week I want to talk to you about prayer. Okay? Before I ever became pastor at Jesus Community Church, uh, we had a series of weeks that I was able to share the word while Kelly was going through some uh, problems with his heart and some procedures and then they had the wedding in Scotland that took them away for a couple weeks. And uh, I, I actually never finished that series. Um, today I want to go back to uh, the Lord's Prayer, what, what some call the Lord's Prayer. Um, I, I don't believe that's actually a very appropriate title. I think that the title should be more the example prayer, um, the exemplar prayer, because he's telling us how we should pray. <coughs> and I just want to hit some highlights in this. But the first thing that we have to understand is that if you are a Christian, the rate at which you mature is going to be completely dependent on your prayer life. Okay? You cannot have a good, solid Christian life without a good, solid prayer life. Okay, um, I can't stress the importance enough for this topic. <coughs> Excuse me. Our prayers tend to be uh, 
kind of like this. These are the issues in our life, and we have family issues, we have financial issues, we have emotional issues, we have other issues, we have some other other issues, and then there's other issues that we're throwing in just because they don't fit one of the other categories. And our prayer life a lot of times tends to be like this. <clears throat> okay? And there, there are times where that is absolutely appropriate, where you come to, to a place in your life and you don't know what to pray, and you just go, blah! Okay? But that's not the consistent walk in prayer that we have to have. Okay? If this is the extent of your prayer life, blah! Then probably your Christian walk is going to be blah! All right? Now, the disciples have asked Jesus, you know, what, how, how do we pray? And it's interesting because Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, which is actually, when we were in Israel, we got to see the place that they believed that it happened. And um, it, it was an amazing place. Uh, there's a huge Catholic, um, I, I don't even know what you would call it. They, they own all the grounds. It's run by nuns. Uh, but it's not really an abbey, so it's just a Catholic grounds. And, and they have the place marked where they believe Jesus stood, and there's a wooden cross, and there's a wooden little altar thing that they kneel on, and the cross is encased in glass. And uh, while I was there, kind of looking at what was going on, several women came up, and they kneeled, and they prayed, and they kissed the glass, and, and off they went, which I thought, oh, that's kind of gross. Um, Scholars really actually believe that Jesus didn't stand on the mountain and preach to the people down below like tradition has. He probably stood at the bottom and preached to the people above because the way the, the sound carries there, standing at the top of the mountain, all the sound would have gone behind him and the people wouldn't have been able to hear. Down at the bottom of the mountain, however, with the, the wind coming off the Sea of Galilee, it would carry his voice right up to the mountain and he wouldn't have to speak very loudly. <coughs> so we got to see that area was very cool. Um, and Jesus is going through and, and he's laying down. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is really kind of the keynote, the cliff's notes of what a normal Christian life should be like. The do's and don'ts. Okay? And he comes to this section on prayer in verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5. He says, And when you pray... Now, the and is there because he's tagging this on to the statement that was before it. And I'm kicking all your prayers out of the way, guys. Um, which well, he's talking about giving to the needy. And, and what he's really trying to stress is um, your relationship with God is primarily private. Okay? And, and he's talking about giving to the needy. And, and then he comes on to prayer. So he says, and. Okay, And when you pray, now notice he doesn't say if you pray. He says when. Okay, So there's no thought here that you're not going to pray. There's not even a command to pray here because it's assumed that you will, that you are. Okay, So, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. <clears throat> so we already have a couple of, of conditions that are to be set. Um, the majority of our prayer life, most people will never see. The meat of our prayer life, most people will never see. Okay? 
Now, that's really easy to cop out on because you go into your room, you shut the door, and lay down to pray and take a nap. You know, your, your father who sees what's done in secret sees that too. So, you know, it's not just about getting alone. It's about getting alone and spending time with him. And all throughout Jesus' ministry on this earth, we see over and over again that he would separate himself out from the people. He would separate himself from the disciples. He would go to a lonely place where there weren't people around him. And he could be alone with the Father. Okay? Um, it also says, do not heap up empty phrases. I'm not sure what that would translate to today. Um, but I don't think it's saying, don't just keep asking for the same thing. Because Jesus actually gives us the parable of the persistent widow. And, and the, the judge who neither feared God nor man, um, but he got tired of this woman coming and she wore him down. And he said, I'm going to give her justice just so she will leave me alone. So I don't think he's saying, don't keep bringing the same requests. You have a request, a, a need in your life. Uh, you're praying for salvation for your loved ones. Don't just throw it up to God and leave it. Bring it back to him. Keep bringing it. Keep bringing it. Keep bringing it. Because it says when we pray according to his will, it will be done. Okay? So keep praying. Keep praying. Now, a lot of times I think these, these empty words are when we try and get fancy with our prayers. I, I, I have told you guys this before. Uh, Christy and I pray together every day. Okay? Um, we used to do that. We did that before we got married. We did that for a while after we got married. And somewhere along the way, it just kind of petered out. And, and for years, we didn't pray together. And then we started praying together again. We, we felt like God was really um, speaking to us and we needed to pray as a couple. And so we started praying as a couple. But I told her before we started, I said, look, please don't pray too much. Because I, I'm very simple in my prayers. I just say what I feel like I would say if I'm talking to another person. And I just talk with God, and I don't have a lot of words that I would say with him. And, and she has these incredible prayers, and she says, she prays things that I go, I never even thought about that needing prayer. And so I told her, please don't pray too much. And that, that's actually a shame to me, because I was more concerned about how it appeared than I was in what we were doing. And uh, we got to the point where, you know, we, we pray, and we, we have our list of things that we go over every day. We pray for salvation for our, our family members and our loved ones. We pray for safety for our kids, that they would grow increasingly closer to God. We pray specific things. We pray over specific people in the church that we know have needs. We pray over specific people in the church that we don't know have needs, but God's laid on our hearts. We pray over the peace of Jerusalem. We pray over the first of the church. We have a, a series of things that we pray together each day. Okay? But I think this many words is when we try and get fancy with our prayers. Okay? Instead of just... Praying from our heart, we try to impress somebody. Because if we're alone with God, it's only him and me. And he's not going to be impressed by any fancy words I use. He invented them. And I'm not really going to impress myself because I'm going to realize that I really have no idea what I'm talking about. So I think really what, what this directive here is saying is just be straightforward and honest with God. Okay? And then he goes down and he says, God already knows what you need. Okay? And then he says, pray like this. Now this is the model prayer. This is the example. And I'm going to read through the prayer, and then I want to go back and I want to break it down piece by piece. And I'm not going to be as detailed as I was a couple years ago. Maybe at some point we'll get back to this series and I'll actually go through the whole thing. But uh, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then some of the other, uh, the newer manuscripts actually insert a verse in there. And it says, uh, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, in some of your Bibles, this, this verse might be left out. Okay? It might be in your footnotes at the bottom. Don't worry. They're not trying to cheat you out of God's Word. Okay? Uh, a lot of things have come up in the last couple years about 
these new translations leaving out parts of God's word. No, actually, what they're doing is they're trying to get as close to the original text as they possibly can. Okay? And, and this verse right here only appears in some of the later texts. Now, does this change the word of God? No, because this is a verse that you're going to find in other places repeated. Okay? So, don't freak out if yours doesn't have that verse there. Okay? Because it is still his kingdom, his power, and his glory. That doesn't change anything. So back down to verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. So let's go back and let's take this apart. Okay? These are the things that our prayers should be modeled after. Okay? And, and I don't know that they specifically have to be in this order. I would actually probably say they don't have to be in this order because I've seen some of the other prayers that Jesus prayed out loud and they don't follow this order. But these are the components that we want to have put together when we pray. First, our Father in heaven. That's an acknowledgement. Okay? We are acknowledging who he is and who we are. Okay? The first statement, he says, our Father. So our represents a group. So our would all be the children of God. Okay? And the children of God are who? Well, John chapter 1 says, those who believe. Okay? That's one of my, my really big pet peeves is when I see people or hear people say, you know, oh, we're all God's children. No. We're not. Absolutely not. Romans and Galatians both make it clear that only some are given the permission, the right to call him Abba Father. So when they say, uh, you know, as Oprah Winfrey, if there's Oprah Winfrey fans in here, I apologize if I offend you, but she's wrong. Oh, they're all just different paths leading to the same God. We're all his children. That's a lie straight from hell. That's the devil speaking. That is not God because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So the Muslims are not on the same path we are. The Buddhists are not on the same path we are. The way they are going is 180 degrees away from God. Okay? So it's not... We're all God's children. We are all his creation, absolutely. But only them that believe are given the right to be called the children of God. So first there's an acknowledgement. There is an us, there is an our, that is the children of God, and he is our father. Okay. Now it's interesting, in both Romans and Galatians, Paul refers to this, he says, Abba. Father, which is Father, Father. One is the Aramaic expression, one is the, the Greek expression. But the Abba actually carries with it a lot more personal note than the Potter. Okay? And, and this Abba is, is much more an idea of a young child calling out to his father rather than a grown-up child. Okay? So when you look at this dynamic here, our Father in Heaven, you have to understand you're a child. Okay? And you're not even really a grown-up child. You're the child that he wants to pick up and hold close to his heart. Okay? And then he says, in heaven. And I think this is very specific because right here we're understanding the vast difference between who and where God is and who and where we are. Um, he is in heaven. That is where his rightful place is. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his Footstool. This is where he rests his feet, folks. Um, what we got here, and as good as it is, the valley is absolutely beautiful. It's nothing compared to where he is. So right there, we're seeing a marked difference in position and place. Okay? <coughs> hallowed be your name. Hallowed. Does anybody know what hallowed means? Holy. Holy. What does holy mean? <coughs> Set apart. He is completely apart and removed from us prior to Christ. Okay? There is such a difference that he can't even be lumped together in the same group. 
There's God, and there's everything that's not God. There's holy, and there's everything that's not holy. And what makes salvation so incredible is the holy reached into the unholy and took them out and made them holy. And all the junk that made them unholy, made them profane, was left behind. And, and actually, it was attributed to and laid on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. So we are now holy, okay? So holy be your name. Now, this is a really cool thing, because what is the name of God? Well, we actually have a number of names of God, okay? How did he identify himself to Moses? Jeannie, do you remember? In the bush. I am. I am. I am. And, and we look at that phrase and we go, I am? What does that mean? Duh. I think, therefore I am. Some people have yet to prove that to me. Okay? Um, I am, in that, that little phrase, he is the eternally self-existent one. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't, uh, and we have a hard time fathoming that. We're people that need oxygen, water, food. We have lots of needs. So we don't really understand this. Um, holy is your name. Even the name of God is holy. And that's why scripture says that we should not profane the name of God. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, when I was a kid, uh, you know, that was the GD word. Words. Okay? But how many times have I heard people go, Jesus! Or, oh God! Or they take the name and position of the one that we're serving and treat it like something unholy. Did you know that's offensive to God? <coughs> Did you, did you know that's sin? <clears throat> holy is your name. Even the very name of him is holy. And what's really cool about this, do a study. If you haven't already, do a study on the names that God has given himself. Some of those names are absolutely incredible. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our banner. He's our shepherd. He is the almighty one. Incredible. And these are things that he has named himself so that he can reveal more of himself to us. So let's go forward. Your kingdom come. What is, what is, what is your kingdom come? You understand that the kingdom of God is in the process of being built, right? That it is not yet finished. Jesus said that the fields are white unto harvest. And that we should what? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that workers might be sent into the field. So we should be praying that the harvest can be gathered in, that the barn may be full, that the kingdom will come. Okay? So prayer is something that drives the gathering in of the harvest. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Do we really want that? Now, now think about that honestly for a minute. Do you really want God's will, or do you want God's will to be your will? <laughs> because all too often when we pray, we are asking God to accomplish our will, rather than asking God to mold us to his. And it, it's a very insidious thing. It sneaks in and it weaves its way into our prayers and all of a sudden, God is no longer God. He's no longer the Holy One, the Sovereign, the one that is completely separate. He's a genie in a Bible. And we have this idea that, you know, uh, just because we want it, it's got to be good. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't pray for things. We're going to address that in just a minute. But... The drive, the focus should be his will being accomplished. Okay? On earth as it is in heaven. Okay? 
The will of God being accomplished in heaven? Yup. The will of God being accomplished on earth? I, I can tell you from my personal experience, sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes not so much. Okay? That, that's, that's the whole purpose of this little portion here. That his will would be done. God, mold me and shape me to the furthering and accomplishment of your will. And then right after that, it says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, do you notice the order here? <clears throat> First, there's an acknowledgement. Okay? We acknowledge who he is, his position. We understand that even his very name is holy. Okay? And then there's the building of the kingdom and his will. And then our will. Okay, this is where we pray for our needs. And, and quite honestly, if you look at this one line out of this entire passage, we, we really give that disproportionate amount of our time, don't we? <clears throat> don't we? And forgive us our debts. As we forgive those, or as the, see I've memorized this in King James, sorry, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now this is a, an interesting dynamic, this is important, okay? Right here is the crux of how we desire our relationship with God to operate. How we live it out is how we want it applied. This is the golden rule right here, okay? This is the golden rule being applied from us to God and God to us. If I want his forgiveness, I've got to be forgiving. Now, don't get me wrong here. I don't believe that Jesus is making this a salvation issue, okay? Because nowhere in scripture does it put this condition on our being saved. However, there is a measure by which we will stand before him and be judged by what we did and how we lived. Okay, we're now stewards of his, and we will give an account for every word. Okay? And if you are living in unforgiveness, if you have an area in your life where you just have not forgiven someone, you have got to lay it down. You have got to choose to lay it down. And I know some of you have huge, huge hurts. Huge wrongs that have been done you. But they were done to God first. And the cross is all we need to know about forgiveness. Because he went on the cross and he looked down through eternity and he saw my life. And he said, I am willing to forgive him all of it. All of it. Who then am I to hold bitterness and unforgiveness towards someone else? I, there are people that have offended me that I didn't even realize offended me. And God forgave those too. There are things that I did that offended God that I'm not even aware that I did that offended God. And he has forgiven me those too. So right here, the golden rule being laid down, okay? Forgive us as we forgive them. It's an ongoing process. And, and this is not a one-time thing, folks. When you forgive somebody, it's not just like, okay, I forgive you and move on happily about your life. Because there are things that are going to keep popping back up in your mind. The enemy does not want this to happen. He loves it when you wrap those chains around you, Okay? So he's going to keep popping that thing back up at you. And it's going to keep coming back up into your mind. And it's going to be put back in front of your face. Every time you've got to say, no, I have forgiven that. I am not going to stay here. I am not going to reside here. I have moved on. Okay? <coughs> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this is, this is kind of an interesting twist. Because the way this reads to our English minds is that God is the one that actually lures us to the place where we're tempted. 
James chapter 1 makes it very clear that that's not the case. What I think is being said here is that the, the, the twisting has taken place from the Greek to the English. And what he's saying is, lead us away from this, not don't lead us to it. Okay? Keep, us, keep our paths guided, just like David said in the Psalms. He said, make the way broad before me that my foot would not stumble. Okay? Keep me from going to those places where I would stumble. Because God doesn't tempt. James 1 makes it very clear. God is not tempted, nor does he tempt. But he does test. Now, our foolishness oftentimes takes a test and turns it into a temptation. But that's us, not him. Okay? And then, but deliver us from evil. Now, some, does anybody here have a translation that reads, the evil one? Okay, what is your translation, the NIV? It says, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Okay, now this, this idea here, again, this is something that doesn't play over very well to the English, but the idea is the all-encompassing stuff that is not God. Okay, so deliver us from all of that. Keep us away from all of that. Now remember we have our holy and not holy. And it, it's more even localized than just not holy. It's specifically evil. It, it's working at odds against God. Okay? So deliver us from this. And then we have this, this, this missing passage. Um, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, that's simply acknowledging. We're going right back to acknowledging who he is. He's wrapping up exactly where he started with an acknowledgement. Okay? So let's, let's break this down real quick. Um, this is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. This is an acknowledgement of his identity. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We acknowledge his plan. Give us this day our daily bread. We acknowledge our physical need. Whatever that might be. And forgive us our debts. We acknowledge our spiritual need. As we also have forgiven our debtors. We acknowledge our soul need. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We acknowledge our need for his protection and deliverance. And then, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, we acknowledge his authority and position again. Okay? Now, this is the guideline, the outline, if you will. Okay? Take these home, write it out. First, I'm going to acknowledge his identity. Uh, I'm God... You are awesome. You are the sovereign creator of all. You are my father. I am your child. Acknowledge his position, his plan. He is holy. I am not. He has made me holy. Thank you, God, for that. His plan is that all men would be saved. God, and, and make it specific. Acknowledge his plan. God, these are the people in my life that, that need salvation. Write them down. Pray over them. Pray them for them by name. But that's going to take a long time. Yeah, maybe. But, but I only have an allotted three and a half minutes to get up earlier. Dump watching a TV show that's probably not good for you anyway. Give up something that can be given up in exchange for this. Okay? Um, then come into acknowledging your need. This is the area of your life where you're presenting to God. Hey, God, I need transportation. i got to get from point A to point B. <coughs> Quite honestly, um, I think sometimes we grow very prideful in the presentation of our needs. Uh, we don't say, I need transportation. We say, God, I want this car, this model, this year, and this color. And God says, well, really, all you need is a 
ride to there and I'm going to put you in a carpool that's going to further my kingdom because I'm going to give you an opportunity to witness to those people in your carpool. God, that's not what I want. No, but it's what you need. Okay? Understand it's about need, not want. Okay? Um, acknowledge your spiritual need. Okay? Now, do you understand the difference between body, soul, and spirit? Let me break it down for you really quickly. Body is your physical being. It's the part that I shake hands with. Okay? Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. This is the part that makes you unique. This is why twins can be identical and act nothing alike. Okay? They're independent because God has created in us a soul. And then... If you are born again, there is a spirit that is birthed, that is that part of you that communes with God. And this is where the Holy Spirit dwells, and it's your spirit and your flesh, which is really the other two parts, not just the physical, the body, but it's also your mind, will, and emotion, and they're in conflict. Okay? And really, it's your soul that makes the determination, am I going to walk according to my flesh, or am I going to walk according to the Spirit? Okay? So, when I'm talking about your physical need, your spiritual need, and your soul need, I'm talking about those things that would bind you up, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Those areas of weaknesses that you might have in your life. We all have them. And mine are going to be different than yours, and yours are going to be different than theirs, and everybody's is different, but we all have them. Okay? So, uh, moving down, acknowledge your need for his protection and deliverance. Be like that persistent widow. Keep going back. Be like that incredible neighbor that comes to your door in the middle of the night and pounds on the door and says, Hey, I got a visitor. I don't have enough food. Can I borrow a loaf of bread? I'm in bed. Go away. No, no, you don't understand. It's an important visitor. It's my great aunt Marge, and she needs bread. I'm in bed with my children. Go away. As if that's going to be more impressive than, you know, you're just in bed by yourself. <laughs> Our bed was divided in three ways. Christy took her half out of the middle. And the kids got 45% of my half, which was on the other side of her. And that left 5% for me right on the edge. And now that we're at a, an age where our children don't come to bed with us anymore, I still sleep in my 5%. <laughs> but Christy just roams all around her 95%. <laughs> and that neighbor keeps pounding, and he's going to keep pounding until you get out of bed and go and get a loaf of bread and open the door and hand it to him gently <laughs> so that he can go home and impress Great Aunt March. Okay? Just because you don't see it happening today, don't give up. Be willing first for God's will. First. Okay? And his will may be, that's not for you, I've got something better. Okay? But pray according to his will, and you know it will be done. Now we get into this whole big convoluted thing of, well, yeah, I'm praying for salvation for this person, and, and they have the right or the ability to choose yes or no. Yeah, but God can put them in a situation where yes looks awfully appealing. Okay? And he will. All right? So don't give up. Even if it looks like the clock is running out, the Super Bowl is lost. You keep praying until that whistle blows. Right? You don't give up. Don't be like that idiot that intercepted the football and ran all the way down to his end zone and right at the end zone he puts the ball out and shows off and the guy that was chugging along behind him reaches out and slaps the ball out of his hand. Right? <clears throat> Carry it all the way through. Run the race as though to win the prize. Prayer. You gotta have faith. You gotta believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. You have got to pray. 
You've got to pray privately. You've got to pray corporately. You've got to get together with other believers. First in your house. If there are other believers in your house, take some time out of the day and pray with them. Even if it's something as quick as, God, I ask that you would bless my husband or wife, my child, my parent, whatever. Keep them today. Watch over them. Draw them close to you. Okay, You don't have to be fancy in your prayers. But pray. Get used to praying with other people. Show up here on Wednesdays. Oh, but Wednesday, I've got such and such. Really, what is more important on Wednesday? Coming together and lifting up the needs of the body and coming and spending time in prayer with believers, presenting these things to God or whatever you're doing. Am I trying to guilt trip you? No, I'm trying to give you a reality. Okay? Wednesdays, we should have a lot of people here. Uh, I tell you what, we've got an incredible prayer group. We average 12 to 14 people every Wednesday. But, you know, we've got over 70 people in this fellowship. That's, that's about one out of every seven people is showing up. Okay? Um, you've got to knuckle down and start praying. When things start getting rough, and, and trust me, we have not seen rough yet. When things start getting rough, you want to be a prayer warrior because our fighting is done on our knees. Okay? So, Father, we bless you today. And I thank you, Lord God, that we can pray to you. Father, that we can present our requests to you, that you already know them, that you're already moving. But Father, you delight to hear our prayers. I ask God that you would make of this fellowship an army of prayer warriors, an army of intercessors. Father, that the reach of this church would go far beyond these walls, would go far beyond this valley, would go far beyond this country, and would even go far beyond this earth. I am asking, Lord God, that you would make us a praying body. We bless you today, Father. We thank you for your word. And I thank you for those that are gathered here, Father. And I ask your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.